The goal of this introduction is to provide the fundamentals of HTTP. This screencast is divided into two parts. The first one is mainly descriptive, and it's where I will describe why this protocol exists and some of its main features. The second part is more hands-on, and that's when we'll see how HTTP works in practice. With the aid of simple tools like the network client Telnet, we'll see how data is exchanged when using HTTP. Now let's have a look at less frequently used methods. When a server receives a head request, it only sends back the headers, but not the resource itself. This can be useful in some cases, for example, when a client just wants to know whether a resource has been recently modified in order to save bandwidth. Let's prepare a head request for an image. Open a connection to localhost. From the response, we can see it's an image of a certain size, but the server didn't send the resource in the message body. But web applications are complex and often need servers to keep track of user sessions. A classic example is the e-commerce website, where users log in with a username and password and then navigate through several pages to complete their purchase, while the server is able to recognize users without asking for usernames and passwords on each page. To solve this problem, the server provides a client with a string of data which is used to identify the user uniquely. The client must add this string of data without ever modifying it to all subsequent requests so that the server may recognize the user. Often, to avoid unwanted manipulation of data, these strings of data are encrypted. These strings of data are called cookies. For those who are wondering why cookies are so called, the name comes from fortune cookies. They are similar in that both of them contain hidden data. To send cookies to clients, servers use the set cookie header. Clients instead use the cookie header in their requests. Cookies are in text format and are structured in name value pairs separated by semicolons. Every cookie has a name and a value and may be followed by a list of predefined attributes, which include comment, domain, max age, path, secure, and version. Let's see an example right away. This time, we're going to use a real website. We'll use the head method since we're only interested in the response headers. Here we can see that YouTube has sent us two cookies whose contents are not at all obvious, although we can see their expiration dates and the domain to which they belong. Here's the domain and the expiration dates. In this case, the domain is Google because, as everyone knows, YouTube is owned by Google. At this point, we are finally able to read and understand the elements of this response. We can see that the page expires immediately, and it must never be stored in a public cache. The server tells us that the resource is an HTML page in the ISO 88591 character set. There are two cookies, and the server header that tells us that YouTube uses software called GWS as its web server. We can tell that the following header, XXSS Protection, is a non-standard header because it begins with the letter X. Usually, a web search is enough to find out what it's for. In this case, the header is used to disable a filter in Internet Explorer 8, which alerts users of possible cross-server scripting attacks. It's possible that the YouTube website triggers this filter, and the programmers want to avoid alarming IE8 users. At the bottom, we see the now-familiar headers, transfer encoding,